All right, so if you're in youth group, if you're in seventh grade to 12th grade, I wanna personally invite you. I know it's really personal with me being up on the stage to youth group. Uh, so we're kicking off youth group on the 20th, as Dylan said, and it will be here at the church at 6.30. If you have questions or wanna know information, feel free to contact me, stop me after the service, or you can email me. And then if you're a young adult, we'd love to see you this Friday here at the church for a worship night. So young adult, uh, we uh, identify you as anything from 18 to 30. So if you say, hey, I'm a young adult and I'm 32, it's like, sorry, you're not young anymore. Um, <laughs> And so uh, with that, let's uh, get underway. So um, before we really dive into the message, uh, I have to at least recognize what day it is. It's 9-11, so 21 years ago, uh, the world completely changed by two planes hitting the Twin Towers. And so um, in that day, we saw 2,000 plus American lives taken because of a terrorist attack, and it forever altered the way we do and live life. Uh, I was in first grade at the time, so that's either telling you how old I am or how young I am. Uh, I don't know where you fall in that line, but I was in Mrs. Dice class, and I still remember seeing the planes hit the towers. And so um, before we kick off the message, I just wanna honor uh, you people who have served in our government in um, law enforcement and fire department and um, the military and border patrol. So if you fall into any of those categories, if you've ever served in any of those areas, I would like you to please stand as we acknowledge your service uh, here. So if you've served in the military, if you've served in law enforcement, Grandpa, I see you, you're not standing, please stand. Uh, so sweet, thank you, Grandpa. Thank you, thank you for serving our nation. So with that, I'm just gonna pray for you guys and uh, then we'll kick off the message. Dear Jesus, we just praise you. We thank you for our military, God. We praise you and we thank you for our law enforcement. We thank you for our firefighters who serve our nation and help us uh, live a life of liberty, uh, life in liberty and a pursuit of happiness. So we just, we praise you for them. We praise you and thank you for these uh, men and women who serve our nation to make it a better nation. So we just, we, we praise you we, uh, and we thank you um, for bestowing that, uh, call on their lives. And so we just pray, pray blessing upon them in your name, amen. All right, so uh, last week, Dana preached on John 4. So if you missed last week, uh, you guys should just go onto the YouTube and check it out. Uh, it's uh, NSC Bellingham, and you should find it. It's, uh, he preached all about spirit and truth. And so he uh, opened up with John 4, basically uh, the woman of Samaria and her questions of worship. And so we're gonna step right back into that narrative, right, right back into that story of the woman of Samaria. And after she has a proper understanding of what worship is, then what happens after that? Okay, so let's begin with verse 25. And so just a little context. The woman, uh, she had, uh, she was basically um, a woman of the night. She had five husbands. She slept around. Jesus still welcomed her. She was an outcast of the outcast. Jesus still loved her. And he was basically, basically leading her to salvation. And then we pick up in Matthew 5, and she had this question about um, worship and he answers it in spirit and in truth. And so let's pick up in verse 25. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. So little, uh, we'll stop right there. We're gonna go through uh, verse 45, but we'll stop right there for the time being. So uh, quick question, what is uh, Jesus' last name? I'm glad no one's really responding, a uh, rhetorical question. Uh, his last name is not Christ. Uh, Christ is his title. Uh, Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah, uh, is the wor a word means the same thing. It means anointed one. The Messiah is the Hebrew word. Christ is the Greek word. So uh, let's not fall prey to that going, hey, Jesus' last name is Christ, right? No, it's not. It's just Jesus. They didn't have surnames back then. Uh, so it'd be like hello or bonjour, same, same meaning, different word or different different language, so Messiah, uh, Hebrew, uh, Christ is Greek. And so I wanna lay out three questions for us as we look at this uh, text right here. Uh, what, what are the three viewpoints of Messiah or the Christ? So it means anointed one or chosen one. Uh, so three questions, what is the Samaritan's view? What is the Jewish view and what is 
our view. So we'll start uh, with the Samaritans' view. So Dana talked about last week how the Samaritans only believed in the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. Uh, good luck spelling Pentateuch if you're taking notes. Uh, but they only believed in the first five books of the Bible. And so the Samaritans really had a very limited view of what the Messiah or the Christ would be. And so uh, D.A. Carson, he says this would be their viewpoint of the Messiah. So uh, D.A. Carson, do we have that quote? Uh, D.A. Car- Carson says, Samaritans preferred uh, Tahab, uh, the restorer, or possibly he who returns. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. This is more typical a Samaritan than a Jewish expectation. So the Samaritans viewed the Messiah mostly as a teacher or as a prophet, very limited view. Uh, They picked this up mostly from Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 through 19. We'll just read it. Read it, and so as we're reading this, be thinking of them viewing Jesus as a teacher or a prophet. So the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you from your brothers, it is to him you shall listen, just as you denied, uh, 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 desired of the Lord your God at Harab on the day of the assembly when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire anymore, lest I die. Then the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, speaking of Jesus, and he shall speak to them all that I commanded him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. So they have a very limited view of Jesus. They basically only viewed him as a teacher, as a prophet, but here she is claiming that Jesus is the Messiah. So what do, what do the Jews think of the Messiah? I'm really glad you asked. You guys are really good question askers. Uh, 2 Samuel 7, verse 12 through 17. Now, this is not gonna be a full biblical narrative of who the Messiah or who the Christ is because frankly, we'd be here probably till tomorrow night and I still would just be doing introductions. But we're just gonna be camping out in Samuel 7, uh, verse 12 through 17 real quick. And we see four promises in this. There's many more promises in it, but we're only gonna be focusing on four right now. Uh, The promise of the uh, continuity of David's seed, the promise of Yahweh's uh, perpetual faithfulness and mercy in spite of his discipline of David's son, talking about David and Bathsheba, Uh, the promise of the unique father-son relationship and the promise of an eternal throne for David. This is why Jesus had to come from the line of David. This is why Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And so this... So the shoe is getting smaller and smaller. So if we view the Messiah as the chosen one, the one that was prophesied, the Samaritans have this kind of view, the Jews have this kind of view, and then us as Christians, we obviously have like a very singular view that it has to be Jesus. No one else can be the Messiah, the anointed one. And so the reason why this is so crazy here in verse 26 that Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he, is because this is the only time in the entire Bible where Jesus claims to be the Messiah himself. I mean, there's other times where he claims like his divine ship, but this is the most clear point where Jesus claims to be the Messiah. Uh, Jesus in all the other gospels never comes right out and he says that he is the Messiah. For example, in the gospel of Mark, he uses the title son of man, which is playing off of uh, Daniel's uh, prophecy of the son of man. And it is, he is secretive about it. So when he heals someone, uh, he goes, hey, go and tell no one what I have done. He's trying to keep it under wraps. Uh, There's a demon possessed man crying out, you are the son of man. And Jesus rebukes him and silences him and doesn't allow him to speak because Jesus is not ready to declare his messiahship yet, but here he is declaring his messiahship. And then the second reason why this is crazy is who he is speaking to. He's speaking to a Samaritan woman, not only just a Samaritan woman, but a Samaritan woman who's an outcast. She's an outcast of the outcast. Like the outcasts don't want her. And Jesus reveals his fulfilled prophecy, his his anoint, his him being the anointed one right here to a a Samaritan woman, an outcast of the 
outcasts. And then the third reason why this is absolutely crazy, now there, there are many I am statements in the Bible, but most famously there are seven I am statements in the Gospel of John. And so uh, the fact that Jesus claims his Messiahship here is another huge thing. So let's just walk through the seven I am statements real quick. Uh, so the first one is I am the bread of life. John 6.35, I am the light of the world. John 8.12, I am the door. John 10.7 through 9, uh, I am the good shepherd. John 10.11, I am the resurrection and the life. John 11.25, I am the way, the truth and the life. John 14.6, I am the, the vine and my father is the vine dresser. dresser. Um, John 15 verses one through five. And then we see right here, that Jesus says another I am statement. Uh, the NIV translates the uh, verse 26 as this. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Another I am statement. So for you parents, how many parents do I have in the room? Show of hands. Sweet. So when your kids come back from Sunday school and they go, hey, there's seven I am statements, you go, no, kid, you're wrong. You're so dumb. There's eight. Uh, don't do that. That's bad parenting. I'm becoming a new father, so don't take parenting advice from me. Uh, but there's eight I am statements, and th this one is I am the Messiah. And so what does this mean for us? Mark Strauss, he says this, the most significant are his claims to extraordinary authority, speaking about him claiming to be the Messiah, as the inaugurator of the kingdom of God over demons and disease of the law and the Sabbath to forgive sins and as the final judge of all people. This means that Jesus is hope realized. This means that he is something to behold. All this hope and prophecy that has been building up for millennia now is being fulfilled in Jesus. And Jesus is claiming it here in John 4, 26. And what is the woman's response when Jesus says, I am he? What is her response? Well, I'm really glad you asked. Verse 27, just then his disciples came back and they marveled that he was talking with a woman not just a Samaritan woman, but a woman, but no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into the town and said to the people, come see. A man who told me all that I ever did, can this be the Christ? Her response to Jesus declaring his Messiahship was come and see. So, uh, she went from being scared to being around people in John 4. She's going to the well in the middle of the afternoon when no one else would be there. She's ashamed. She's an outcast of the outcast. And all of a sudden, she goes, come and see. She is running into community. She's running towards people going, hey, come and see the Messiah. She, she was eager to tell people about Jesus. When was the last time you shared the gospel with someone? When was the last time you invited someone to church? When was the last time you told someone you were a Christian? Are you willing to say, come and see? Or, or is the gospel not good news to you? Because the gospel is good news. We shouldn't be ashamed of the gospel. The gospel is something to be, be proclaimed. Uh, Romans 1, 16 says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes uh, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so are you ashamed of the gospel? Are you not ashamed of the gospel? We know what the Bible calls us to do, not to be ashamed of the gospel, but are you ashamed of the gospel? What are you doing with the gospel? Are you saying come and see or are you not saying come and see? There's no gray area. It's either you are or you're not. Or you're not. Um, what was, when was, the, um, and then how did this woman go from being scared to share the gospel to having no shame? How did she go from being, I don't wanna be around anyone, now she's running into the city saying, come and see, what changed, what happened there? She encountered Jesus, that's what changed. When was the last time you encountered Jesus? When was the last time you saw Jesus? Are you just waiting for Jesus to come to you? Are you chasing after Jesus? Uh, in verse 31, we see that Jesus' response is that he finds his satisfaction in doing the will of his Father. This is God put on human flesh, and he's reclaiming the gospel here in verse 31. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat, because remember, Jesus came to the well, he was hungry, he was thirsty. Uh, 
And he, the, the woman was like, hey, I have water for you. He's like, oh, I'll give you water ever, everlasting. And he's speaking of spiritual things and we see the same thing happening here. So keep in mind uh, as we read, uh, Rabbi, eat. But, but he said to them, I have, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? And like, I'm just thinking like as a friend, like if my, like I'm like hanging out with my buddy and he's like, oh yeah, dude, I, I already have food to eat. I'm going, man, did he like stash away like a loaf of bread in, in his shirt? Like, uh, I don't know about you guys. Uh, if anyone works at the movie theaters, I apologize in advance, but I, I constantly sneak in food into the movies. I'm cheap, I'm Jewish Dutch, so like, super cheap, and so like I, the biggest thing I've ever snuck in was like a gallon of milk, because I really like twin book chocolate milk. Um, but so, so my thought instantly goes to, hey, did, uh, is Jesus like stashing away food? Like maybe, um, but no, he's speaking of spiritual things. And Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Uh, so let's back up a second. Bread is often used as a representative of this world, meaning it is a thing of our desiring desires of our flesh. And so uh, let's just walk through the biblical theology of bread throughout the scripture. So uh, Jesus, when he begins his ministry, he uh, goes on a 40-day fast into the wilderness, and uh, the Bible clarifies that he was very hungry. Uh, I just love that about the Bible, that it's like uh, scholars will love to debate every little detail, but here in Matthew, it says like, yeah, he didn't eat for 40 days and he was hungry. Like, it's like, yeah, obviously, I go like 12 hours without eating and I'm starving. Intermittent fasting is horrible. Um, but uh, so Jesus right here, uh, he, he doesn't eat for 40 days and the devil comes to him and he goes, hey, you know, those rocks, I mean, you're God incarnate. Why don't you just turn those into loaves of bread? And Jesus is quoting the Old Testament here. And he says this in Matthew 4, 4, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then we see again in John 6, uh, 35, an I am statement, I am the bread of life, meaning satisfaction is found in Jesus. And then in the Exodus, um, God took the people of Israel off bread, off the dependence on their own works and made them completely dependent on him. He was a pillar of fire by night and a cloud uh, by day and he gave them manna, which is bread from the heavens, and we see this in Deuteronomy 8, 3, and he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from his mouth. Is Jesus your bread? Is your satisfaction being found in Jesus, or is it being found in like Avenue bread? What's your satisfaction being found in? Where is your satisfaction coming from? What brings you joy, not happiness, but joy? Joy is long-lasting, not built on circumstances. Happiness is temporal and based on circumstances. What is satisfying you? Is it the kingdom of God or is it your own kingdom? God's rule or your rule? Things of this earth or things eternal? What is satisfying you? Because Jesus, what was satisfying him was to do the will of the Father. And you might ask, what is the will of the Father, and I'm really good. You guys are just really good at asking questions this morning. Uh, we see that Jesus answers that in verse 35 to 38. Now, as we read this, pay, pay special attention to reaping and sowing. Uh, do, do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Uh, probably December or January. Uh, look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wage and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. So we see right here, there, there's a paradigm of the sower and the reaper. So let, let's, let's break down what sower and reaper mean. So a sower is a person that shares the gospel. Think parable of the sower, casting out seed, uh, flinging them about a reaper is the one who disciples, who brings in the harvest and makes sure the harvest is taken care of. We see this in 1 Corinthians 3, 6. Uh, Paul speaking about him and Apollos' ministry. He says, I planted or I sowed and Apollos wandered or Apollos reaped or discipled, but God gave the growth. And then we see another paradigm shift of reaping and sowing is to do the will of God. But we also see this thing in verse 38 of labor. What does it mean to labor for the harvest? 
Matthew 9, 37 to 38, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers, laborers into his harvest. Are you earnestly praying? Are you sowing? Are you reaping? Are you doing any of these three things for the kingdom of God? Or are you apathetic in your faith? Where do you stand with the way of Jesus? Are you finding satisfaction in him or are you not doing any of these three things? Uh, one of my favorite church history time periods is like revival history. And there's this revival that happened uh, called the Second Great Awakening. Uh, it was with a man called Charles Finney and uh, his buddy, Father Nash. So uh, I think they're a beautiful example of what reaping, sowing, and labor laboring looks like. So what, what happened was there was a, a great awakening that happened in the New England area. Uh, and basically, uh, Charles Finney was very good at presenting the gospel. Like he could speak, people were woo and drawn, and people got saved and uh, devoted their lives to Christ because of his preaching. But the secret remedy to his preaching and his ministry was not that he was a great articulate speaker. The secret to his ministry was Father Nash. And so Father Nash, what he did was he would go into cities before Finney would even get there and he, and he would pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest. He would pray and pray and pray until he felt the Holy Spirit bless that area. And then he would invite Charles Finney to come and preach the gospel and people would get saved. And so my question to you guys is, are you praying earnestly to the Lord of the harvest? Are you sowing seeds? Are you sharing the gospel? Are you discipling people? Are you doing the work of God? Or are you not satisfied in the things of God? And then we see uh, continued ministry happen in verse 39 through 45. Many Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He to told me all that, that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days and many more believed because of, the, of his word. word. And they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you have said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the savior of the world. After two days, he departed for Galilee, for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Ga uh, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. So the question I wanna pose with this final passage is, where do you do ministry? Where are you doing ministry? Jesus did ministry everywhere he went. Are you just holding it out for certain areas in your life? Are you going, hey, when I go on missions trips, that's where I do ministry. Hey, when I'm doing church functions, that's when I'm doing ministry. Or is it actually in your workplace with your friend relations? Are you doing ministry everywhere you go? Are you limiting it to only certain areas of your life? Where are you doing ministry? Uh, and uh, I, I have these friends who like wanna be like missionaries. Like they're like, hey, I like, wanna go and reach the nations. I wanna go reach like the 1040 window. And I'm like, awesome, like we need more missionaries. We need more people with that urgency. But my question to a lot of these people um, is like most of them are doing nothing right now. Um, so like, like right now they're going, yeah, I wanna go reach the Muslim nation, go reach the persecuted nation. But then they're too scared to go to Target and evangelize. Or, or they're too scared to go to Western and do a prayer walk. And they're not even serving their local church. So where are you doing ministry? And they're like going, hey, Andrew, give me 20 bucks a month to support me on my mission trip. I'm like, dude, you're not even doing missionary work here. How do I expect you to go to the nations? And we know that the call of Jesus is first to our area and then to the nations. Acts 1.8, uh, he called them first to Jerusalem and then to the ends of the earth. So begin your ministry here, not there. Begin it here. And so uh, I wanna bring up two myths that we believe as Christians. Uh, the first myth, if we have that slide, is I have to leave in order to be used by God. Uh, what this one sounds like is I can't be around my non-Christian friends anymore. I have to only be around Christian community. Um, I can't, can't be around those people anymore. I have to leave. Um, now, obviously, a caveat to this, if they're causing you to sin, like if you're going from like, being like an opium addict and your friends are like, hey, let's hang out in the opium den. Like, obviously, like, don't do that. Like, so if they're causing you to sin, don't do that. But 
us as Christians, we often believe that if uh, I have to leave in order to be used by God. And uh, there is a case biblically to be made for this. And so let's present the case being made for this myth. And so uh, we see it here in verse 44 and throughout the gospels that Jesus says this, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in, and in his own household. And so we often go, man, if Jesus wasn't welcomed in his hometown, how am I gonna be welcomed in my hometown, right? And then it's backed up by Paul. So the testimony of Paul uh, goes like this. Paul got saved. Uh, he was a persecutor of the church, oversaw the martyr of Stephen, uh, was walking to to Damascus to go kill Christians and destroy the church. And Jesus meets him. He's like, I am the one you're persecuting. And uh, Paul just goes, oh, I'm sorry, and repents and changes his way. And he starts sharing the gospel in Damascus. Uh, persecution comes. He has to flee in a basket out the city wall. And then we pick up in Galatians 1, verse 15, if we have that slide. Uh, this is Paul recounting his testimony. This is uh, picking up right when he's leaving Damascus. But when he who had sent me, uh, set me apart before I was born and who was called by my grace, <laughs> called me by his grace, all the reformers were like, yeah, uh, and was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with anyone, going on to 17, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were, were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cyprus, who is Peter, and remained with him 15 days. So there is a case to be made for leaving your your old life behind and finding a new life. Uh, Jesus says a prophet is not welcome to his own town. And Paul right here in Galatians saying, hey, I went away for three years to, to go and figure out what it means to follow Jesus. So there is a case to be made of you have to leave in order to find Jesus. But there's also a case against it. And so the case against it comes right here in this passage. Uh, we see the woman at the well that she didn't go away, she ran towards community. She didn't run away from her old life, she ran towards it and got them all saved. And probably the most famous example of this uh, being the case is in Matthew 5. There's a demon-possessed man and he's... Uh, shackled up, he's chained up in a cave, and he's breaking chains and breaking rocks, and his name is Legion, for there is many demons in him. And Jesus comes to town, he casts out the demons in this man, casts them into the pigs, the pigs go running off the cliff, great Bible story in Mark 5, super action-packed. Um, but uh, he gets saved and gets delivered, and then Jesus says, we pick up the story with this in Matthew 18 through 20. Uh, and Jesus is leaving the area, the guy gets saved, and he says, as, as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be, might, might be with him. He just wants to be with Jesus. I mean, how wrong is that? That's a complete right thing right there. And then verse 19, this is key. And he did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and he began to proclaim in the Decropolis, which is a whole region in Israel, how much Jesus had done for him and everyone marveled. So uh, there, there's a case to be made for, for and against of I have to leave to be used by God. But sometimes God wants to use you right where you're at. You're, that broken life that you came from, God wants to use you as a beacon of hope for those people. He wants, you, wants your testimony to go out and people to marvel at the work of God not the marvel at the work that you're doing, but marvel at the work that God is doing within you. And so how do we determine wh which one God is calling us to? Because biblically, there's a case to be made for both of these. So how do you determine which one God is calling you to? I'm really glad you asked. We got three points for that. This is how to make good decisions. Three easy steps to make good decisions. Um, and using wisdom. One is wrestle with the Bible. What does the Bible say about the matter? So first, approach the text of the Bible. And be like, what does the Bible say about this topic, this moral issue, this principle of life that I'm gonna do? What does the Bible say? After you deal with that, after you figure out what the Bible says about that, then move on to two, get mentors in your life. A mentor is someone older, wiser than you, who's been through a season of life that you've already been in or that you are in. Uh, and they're gonna say the hard things, not the feel-good things. 
Uh, I have uh, a few mentors in my life, uh, guys that I get together and I basically give them permission to beat up on me and tell me where I'm doing wrong. And most of the time what this looks like is uh, they'll come to me and they'll be like, hey dude, like you really screwed up here. Like you're kind of like sucking as a husband. You need to get like so- something like that. Um, hopefully I'm not sucking as a husband. I'll find out this week. Um, but, uh, but most of the time they, they say these hard things to me and I'm like, man, I, I disagree with them. I wanna fight. I wanna use my wit against them. I want to argue with them. But then after a day or two, I'm going, man, they were right. I'm so glad they had the boldness to speak truth into me and not what I wanted to hear, but what I needed to hear. So get a mentor in your life who's gonna say what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. And then uh, third principle for making wise decisions, having a Christian community, not having a community, but having a Christian community, having people around you who are devoted to Jesus, who love Jesus and are gonna wanna honor Jesus, is gonna challenge you, be like, hey, is that really what the Bible is saying on that? Is that really what God is calling to you? Calling you? Have a good Christian community. Allow others to speak into your life and actually listen to them. I mean, how many of us have had friends who end up in a relationship and all of us as friends go, hey, you shouldn't be with that person. They go on and have that relationship and then like they come back and go, I told you so, because you're a great friend, you do, I told you so, because that's really healthy for relationships. But actually listen to your friends. Um, And so use that as a wisdom of, if God is calling you out of uh, relationships with people or into relationships with people. Uh, The myth two, and now this one could get me into some hot water, but here we go anyways. Uh, Myth two is, we as Christians are called to the nice places. What this one sounds like is, I don't like the politics here, so I'm gonna move to fill in the blank state. It's too spiritually dark here. I I don't want to be here. Uh, It's too oppressive. Um, I don't want to be here. And now a caveat to this, obviously fill in the blank state. Uh, A lot of you guys' minds are going to certain states. Uh, If you have a job offer in that state, go for it. Uh, If God is calling you to that state, uh, use your pastors and your community to confirm that that is actually what God is calling you to. Don't just do the whole, God told me so, so you can't disagree with me. Actually use your community. Uh, but wrestle with these things. But we as Christians are called to the nice places. It's just a complete myth as, as us as Christians. Um, do you think Jesus was a huge fan of the politics of Jerusalem of the day? Like, do you think he really agreed with the Pharisees? Do you really think he agreed with Herod? Like, do you think Jesus agreed with the politics? I mean, he got so angry about the politics that he made whips and flipped over tables because he was outraged by what they were doing in the temple. So Jesus was not a fan of the politics of the day. Do you think Paul was a fan of Rome's politics around religion? Like, I mean, he got beaten and thrown into prison because of their political ideologies. Like, Jesus, Paul, Jesus were not a fan of the politics of the, uh, of the areas they were living in. Uh, John, do you think he really loved Patmos? Like, he's like, man, I really agree with the politics. Man, I'm fully bought on. And yeah, taller and feather me, I'm totally for that. No, they absolutely were not a fan of their politics of the day. We, as Christians, are called not to, to the nice places, but to the hard places. When it's spiritually dark, we are called to those spots. We are the city set on the hill, as Jesus talks about in Matthew 5. We are the salt of this earth. We are the lights of this world. We are called into the dark places, the places that no one else wants to go in their right mind, we are called to. Uh, Dr. Jason Hubbard, he wrote this book called The Moravians. And in this book, he talks about how the Moravians were so zealful about missionary work that they, they would have funerals before they would go out on mission trips because they know what they were go- going to was complete death. So us are, are, as Christians are called to the hard places, not the easy places. Tim Keller, he writes this, talking about us as Christians and our call to hard places. God called the Jewish exiles to embrace the tension of the city for the sake of God's glory. And this is exactly what today's Christians are called to do as well. We are broken people called to broken places to bring the gospel to restore those places. That's the point of the gospel is when the places are too dark and too broken, we as Christians are called into those places. So uh, me, as, as just one of your pastors in your life, if you call a new song, Church Home, if you're going, hey, I want out of Washington because I just disagree with the politics here. I hate how we handed COVID or anything that you disagree with uh, politically. 
us as Christians are called into that tension of hardship. When we don't agree, we are supposed to still submit in the best way we know how and yet still be salt and light and being that beacon of hope in the midst of the darkness. That is our call as Christians. Uh, There's this famous quote. I don't really know who said it. Uh, if, If you Google it, it will say Augustine said it, Tim Keller said it, this Puritan father said it, but it's just a great quote. And this quote goes like this. The church is a hospital for sinners, not a museum of saints. We are broken people called to broken places. And that's where the gospel is most evident is in those broken places. When the politics are persecuting the church, that's when the church thrives. Look at the church in China right now. The church in China, the underground church is thriving. There's millions and millions of people coming to salvation because within the persecuted nation of China where they hate the gospel, hate it. So if you've tuned me out for this whole message, worship team, communion team, you guys can start coming up. Um, This is basically the the whole message in a nutshell. Uh, One is, are you on mission? Are you on mission for Jesus? Jesus was on mission, are you on mission? Number two, do not be ashamed of the gospel. We are called to share the good news wherever we go. Do not be ashamed of the gospel. Believe it is good news because it is good news. You are saved from sin. It's good news. Do not be ashamed of the good news. And then last point, the, the main point I wanna make is how do you be on mission? How do we go and take back our city? Because Bellingham is so unchurched. We're not in the Bible Belt. Linden is a little bit of a Bible Belt, but Bellingham is definitely not a Bible Belt. Walken County as a whole is not a Bible Belt. So how do we go and we actually be on mission for God? How do we do that? Three easy steps. One, labor, pray, pray, pray. Prepare the fields for harvest. Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest. We got, we got a 24-hour prayer sets. We got prayer sets Thursday nights. We, we, the church is open throughout the week for prayer sets. Get involved in prayer. Be intentional about your prayer life. Be intentional about praying for people's salvation. Prepare the fields for harvest. Number two, sow the seed. Share the gospel. Actually talk about Jesus with people around you. Three, disciple someone. Go out and take someone out and disciple them. Teach them the ways of Jesus. Jesus stayed there for two more days and his last commandment to us as his Jesus followers before he went to be with the, the Father at, the, at, the, at his right hand, he said, go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. So us as Christians are not called to just one of these things. We're called to do all three things simultaneously. So are you praying? Are you sharing the gospel? And are you discipling? You should, if you're not, get with the program. And so Jesus is calling us to the hard area. Step into that uncomfortability. You're going, hey, it's awkward. I'm gonna look weird sharing the gospel. Yeah, you are, but it's wonderful. Go and do it. And if you're wanting to get involved in street evangelizing, I I would love to teach you. I would love to take you under my wing. Uh, I I lead uh, our young adult ministry called Harvest. And basically what we're trying to do right now is uh, Western's about to go into campus. Uh, They're about to go into school session uh, like the week of the 22nd. And basically my goal is to go and be that weird preaching guy up there. I'm not gonna do like the soapbox thing. I'm just gonna go up to people and be like, hey, like, What's your worldview? Are you an atheist? Are you a theist? And just trying to get spiritual conversations going. So are you sowing these seeds? Are you sharing the gospel? Are you going to the lost? Does your heart not break for these things? And so Jesus is calling us into the uncomfortability and are you willing to answer that call? And so I'm gonna pray for us and Taylor's gonna lead us in a time of communion. So dear Jesus, we just praise you. We thank you that you came and you preached the gospel. You stepped down into this earth. You became uh, sin who knew no sin and you put sin to death. So we just, we praise you, Jesus. We praise you that you showed us what the gospel is. It's because you defeated death, sin, shame, condemnation, that we are able to live this life. So we just pray right now for Whatcom County. God, we pray for Bellingham. We pray for the unchurched, the de church. God. We just pray that you just grab a hold of our lives, God. I pray for ourselves, God. I pray that you just give us boldness, that you imbued us with a boldness to share your gospel, that you give us a desire and earnestness to pray for, for, for people to get saved, God. So I just pray that you just highlight people to share the gospel to us, that you highlight people that we could disciple, highlight people we can be praying for. So God, just come and convict us in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, would you